All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to um, the talk by Dr. Jonathan Anomaly. Um, so in case you're wondering, his last name, I believe, is not an anomaly, but in fact, um, Jonathan picked that um, yourself um, as you know, a way to kind of get his name out there. Oh, seriously. Yeah. Um, Jonathan is a professor, and today he's here to talk about some of his research um, on polygenetic embryo selection. Jonathan, take it away. Thank you. All right, thanks for coming, guys. Let's see. So what I want to do here is, ah, <laughs> just going to give a quick overview of, of what we know about heritability, how we know it. That's going to be very quick. And what polygenic scores can do now for health traits, also a bit on IQ, but I'm not going to focus on that here. Talk more about it after in Q&A. And um, integrate prediction markets a bit. So, you know, I haven't thought a lot about it, but I have a couple of ideas for how prediction markets could help you choose among the many heritable diseases um, from which parents are going to be choosing to minimize, that is. So, you know, one idea is you might create a prediction market in which diseases are likely to be cured or treatable um, and manageable when your kids are born in the future. So in the next 10 years, the next 30 years, next 50 years and that'll probably help you prioritize which ones you want to select against. So that's what we're going to talk about. And then I'm going to end with some stuff on regulation. What are some reasons we might want regulations and then some reasons that regulations might fail? Um, ultimately, I'm pretty libertarian on this, regardless of my overall political views. So here we go. Um, yeah, what do we know about heritability? Well, this is a really simple overview because people come from different backgrounds here, but we know all traits are heritable. It's just a question of how heritable they are. Um, we know that most traits are polygenic. That is, they involve many hundreds or thousands of small genetic variants that sum up to an overall risk that you're going to get, let's say, cancer, or that you're going to be taller or shorter, smarter or less smart. Um, even in the case of breast cancer, everyone's heard of the BRAC genes and, you know, BRAC the, the first and the second variant that are really common, that still only accounts for a small percentage of overall breast cancers. Most of them are polygenic. So doing a polygenic risk score, which we'll talk about in a minute, is still going to be quite useful for those, just like lots and lots of other traits. Um, finally, at least for the psychological traits that we care about, like IQ and even personality, um, the effect of genetics seems to swamp the, the effect of the environment. That's not to say the environment doesn't matter. Um, or random developmental noise doesn't matter. So what's not in the heritability score is often a combination of environmental factors and also genetic or developmental noise that we don't understand well. <clears throat> okay, so really quickly, you guys have all heard of twin studies. This was Galton's idea 150 years ago. You know, he's thinking like, what if we could, what if we could do this natural experiment and just go find twins that just happen to be separated at birth and and see how alike or unalike they are along various dimensions that we care about. Well, 100 years later, those, those studies were done in a very systematic way, and now there are many, many thousands, tens of thousands of twin pairs, monozygotic and dizygotic, right? So fraternal and identical twins that have been raised in very different environments. And of course, what you can do then is, you know, see, see how they end up. Um, so you could imagine a twin pair being raised by an auto mechanic and a physics professor, right? And you'd want to see like, okay, are, how different are they based on, on those different environments in which they might grow up? And of course, as you can imagine, provided they've had sufficient nutrients and a decent, a decent home life, their height is not going to vary almost at all, right? Height is about 90% heritable, but their IQ is not going to vary very much either. If they've had some, if they've had iodized salt, they haven't been severely abused, and they've had really minimal access to education, their IQ is pretty much gonna be the same. Now, if you don't meet those thresholds, IQ scores don't really measure anything of interest, but if you do, um, IQ is remarkably heritable too. So that's one way of figuring out how heritable traits are. Another way is through genome-wide association studies that make use of biobanks. You guys have probably heard of the UK biobank, which is the biggest one. And what are these? Well, what you do is take lots and lots of people and you genotype them and phenotype them. So take a genetic sample, get a pretty deep sequence on it, and then just go through a bunch of things you're interested in and measure them. How tall are they? Give them an IQ test if you can. Actually, there aren't many with good IQ tests, unfortunately. 
uh, see whether or not they have breast cancer, see whether or not they have schizophrenia. Um, these are imperfect ways of, of, of doing things, of gauging the heritability of these different traits. Why are they imperfect? Because it's often not a perfectly representative sample. For, for example, a lot of these don't go to prisons. They should go to prisons to try to figure out what the extreme psychopathologies are and how heritable those are and so on. But they're pretty good and they're growing and more countries are, are, are engaging in these and subsidizing them. And what you can do is, of course, with enough genetic samples and enough phenotypes, and you really do need a lot, you need to power these up quite a bit, um, to get interesting results, you can just correlate the, the so-called SNPs or genetic variants. SNP is for you know, single nucleotide polymorphisms that correlate with these traits and across enough people. And if you have good enough metrics for the traits, good enough ways of measuring them, you're going to get interesting results. Now, it's hard to actually get a good causal story for what the SNPs are doing that are associated with the different traits. And that's one of several reasons that CRISPR or you know, descendants of CRISPR are not ready to go. Even if gene editing was completely safe, which it's not, there are many off-target mutations still, you still wouldn't want to do it for highly polygenic traits, in my opinion, yet. You know, we could have a discussion about that, but that's because we don't know exactly what causal role each of those are playing. But if you're selecting among whole genomes, maybe the causal story isn't that important, right? You can get really strong correlations and you can select in favor of or against certain traits. All right, what are the heritability estimates from these things? Yeah, 90, you know, height, that's not surprising, right? 90% heritable. I'm actually surprised it's not higher than that, um, but yeah, it's about 90. IQ, at least by adulthood, studies, you know, on the low end, at 60%, on the high end, 80%. Um, political orientation, that's maybe surprising. I know the Collinses have talked about this. Um, you know, they worry about a world in which only, you know, religious extremists or something are having all the children. Yeah, that would be a very different world across many generations, and maybe Israel is seeing this now, maybe not, but across many generations of that, you would get very different kinds of people. Um, even if you held everything else constant, if, you know, personality traits and political orientation are partly heritable, you know, it's going to change the human temperament across time. Okay, so how can we influence children's traits? Obviously, partner selection is going to be the, the strongest one right now, and that's the strongest one in, in, in history. Um, you know, of course, you can do embryo selection and eventually gene editing, presumably, once it's safe, but you know, you're starting with certain genetic material and, you know, you're going to constrain the options by your partner. So choosing your partner is going to be the most important. Gene editing, I'm not going to talk about because, like I said, it's not ready to go. You've got the problem of off-target mutations, even with CRISPR prime and some of the newer versions. And you've got the, the causal story, which is still highly incomplete. So it's just not ready to go. Uh, maybe for monogenic conditions, some people will start experimenting with that soon, where you've just got one gene, one variant causing something, it's going to be less risky than a polygenic disorder. And then you've got embryo selection. How does it work? Well, IVF, everyone knows about this. You go through, you know, in vitro fertilization, you get a bunch of eggs from the clinic, combine them with sperm, you've got your embryos, you biopsy the embryos. And as you probably know, for many decades now, people have been testing for monogenic conditions like Downs, sorry, not Downs, like Tay-Sachs, like Huntington's, et cetera. You can also do a test, the, the PGTA test, pre-implantation genetic testing, A is for aneuploidy, which has something to do with abnormal chromosome count. And you can select against Downs that way. So this has been available for a really long time. The way that happens is you wait till like day five of the embryo developing, it's got more cell differentiation. You've got an outer layer and an inner layer, and you take a little bit of that outer layer and you sequence it. And you sequence it in a pretty primitive way for aneuploidy. Now you can, you can deep sequence that same tissue and just get really better, better predictions. Um, there's also another kind of recipe that will come on board soon, which is a little more complicated than that, which I'm not gonna talk about here, but it's going to be a breakthrough. Um, okay, so really quickly, because this is the fun trait that people really care about in places like this, what does the best model tell us we can do right now with IQ? And this is not a published model, although it shall be published within probably a year or two. Um, the best we can get right now, well, first of all, it's going to depend on the number of embryos you have, but let's just use 10 embryos as an example. 
you can get a spread of about 12 points for an average gain of about six points. Meaning on average, if you do IVF and select the highest scoring embryo versus not doing IVF, you can get an average of six points. I actually think the average is less interesting than the spread because in general, you're not gonna necessarily choose the highest scoring embryo. Maybe the second highest scoring embryo on the IQ test is gonna have lower risks of cancer or lower risks of schizophrenia or whatever other problems you're interested in. Um, so I think the spread is more important than the average, but it's still pretty cool that we can do this. Um, you know, the models are gonna get better, although there's a problem which James Lee has written about for City Journal. And the problem is it's getting, for some researchers, increasingly difficult to access and study IQ scores and the relationship between genetics and IQ. So accessing these databases that I mentioned earlier in order to either IQ test people and then, and then learn some interesting things about that or use the data in order to derive results of, of this kind it's increasingly difficult to do. And so I think our models are gonna be limited, not so much by science per se, but by the politicization of science. And we can talk more about that in Q&A. Of course, we've talked about this before. Everyone's seen this, in vitro gametogenesis, which is taking an adult cell and reverse aging it, so to speak, turning it into a pluripotent stem cell from which you can then turn that pluripotent stem cell into an egg cell. And that's exciting because sperm are, are pretty cheap and easy to produce. We produce hundreds of millions every day. Um, but eggs are hard to get, especially as you age. And if you could take, let's say, a vial of blood, just to take that example, and create 10,000 eggs out of a vial of blood, well, A, you can avoid having to go through IVF, which is a pain and expensive. And B, you can create much more genetic variation from which you could select both minimizing various disease risks and, and maximizing things like intelligence or whatever personality traits you're interested in. Right now, there haven't been many GWAS on personality, although there are some, especially on neuroticism, but there are more that are coming soon. And at the University of Texas, um, this is being done right now. So soon we'll have predictors for things like conscientiousness, which I think a lot of people especially in this room, you don't just want like a high IQ psychopath, you want a high IQ person who you know, sticks to tasks and, and does them well, and also a morally motivated person. And I think, you know, eventually you'd want to select for things like not just cognitive empathy, but affective empathy. Although the moral selection story, I think, is very complicated. I wrote a book about this a couple years ago, a new version's coming out soon. And I think the most important part of that book is on moral enhancement, because I think it is far, far more complicated than most people think. Why? Because Darwinian evolution has led us to some very interesting distributions of, of, of traits and the, the dispositions that we have, the moral dis, uh, dispositions that we have are not very simple and manipulating them are, is not gonna be very simple. So for example, if you boost oxytocin, one thing that we know is that there's good evidence that it boosts in-group favoritism. So you tend to treat people nicely within your group, including non-kin, cool, okay, but it also increases out-group aggression, at least in certain circumstances. Probably makes you more ethnocentric. Is that a moral enhancement? Um, in some ways, yes, in other ways, no, right? And would you wanna do that if other people weren't doing that? Would you want to increase empathy if no one else was doing it? Or would that set you up for pathological altruism? Right, so I think moral enhancement turns out it's gonna be very complicated and looking at the aggregate patterns that emerge from individual choices will be of supreme importance. Um, we can get into that a little bit later. Anyway, for now, we've got embryo selection. It's gonna be supercharged by IVG once this is online. Let's call it 10 years from now. I don't really know when it's gonna happen. The big controversy here, or the big problem rather, the barrier, is that when you do this, you're using adult cells that have accumulated so-called de novo mutations during the lifetime, and when you reverse age them and turn them into eggs, for example, they carry those mutations. And until you can measure those really well and see what they're doing, even if it's gonna be, I think, quite easy, fair enough, easy enough to, to, to create this process, it's been done in animals, I don't think you'd wanna do it until we really get a grasp on what the mutation load is 
Where on the chromosomes are they happening? Are they point mutations? Are they deletions? What are they? What's happening here? So maybe 10 years, maybe 15, who knows? Okay. Really quickly, because again, we talked about IQ. What are some of the benefits of enhancing IQ? I think there are private and public benefits. There are the obvious internalities. You know, um, smarter people tend to make more money. They tend to live longer and healthier lives. Probably because they have more self-control, they can plan, you know, should I go to the gym or have a certain diet or go to the doctor on time or whatever. You know, they tend to be better at making those kinds of decisions. Um, surprisingly, less criminality. So that's a good thing for you as well as society. Probably, again, not because, you know, smarter people have nicer moral motivations, but because they have more self-control or because they have longer time horizons, that sort of thing. So it's poorly understood why, but it's pretty well demonstrated that these things are true. Um, the public benefits, yeah, obviously economic productivity, scientific innovation, I think the less obvious ones are from Garrett Jones. Um, he wrote a book on this. And that is that higher IQ people tend to cooperate more in various kinds of collective action problems. Cooperation isn't always good in collective action problems. But when you look at prisoner's dilemma games, repeat prisoner's dilemmas, um, it's been tested many times now. What you see is that smarter people understand the benefits, the long-term benefits of cooperation. You can also do this for public goods games. If you don't know what those are, we can talk about that in Q&A. Garrett and I wrote a paper on this a few years ago called Cognitive Enhancement and Network Effects, How Individual Prosperity Depends on Group Traits. And what we argue is that the externalities of raising IQ are probably much bigger than the internal rewards. It's great for your kids to do that. They make more money, they live longer, et cetera. They stay out of prison more, more marital stability. But because of the cooperative benefits of IQ, um, and he actually has shown in groups what you get among high IQ groups is lower levels of corruption as well. What you end up getting is, you know, richer countries with more stable institutions, if countries are at least a macrocosm of the microcosm of groups. And that is a kind of implicit moral enhancement, not by making people nicer, once again, but by creating the conditions in which it's cheap to be nice. So part of the story of moral progress is by raising living standards, fewer people have incentives to, you know, make a living as pirates, um, you know, or, or thinking about like, how do, I, how do I get money now through theft or exploitation? The few people that are prone to do that can learn that there are reasons not to do that in high IQ, um, sorry, in developed countries. So the smarter the population, the more developed the the group is going to be, the country is going to be, et cetera. And that's a kind of implicit moral enhancement, um, Jones and I have argued. So there are going to be lots of good reasons for enhancing intelligence. I'm not going to talk much more about this. I'm now going to turn to health traits that we can enhance. This is a short list of the kinds of things that you can use polygenic scores to select against. And I guess I should define that term. We didn't define it yet. Through data from these genome-wide association studies and through that kind of biopsy that you can get that we already use to test for monogenic conditions and aneuploidy, you deep sequence it, and then you create so-called polygenic risk scores based on that data. And a polygenic risk score just says, what's the chance that this particular embryo is going to have a lower or higher risk of breast cancer, is going to be taller or shorter? than this other embryo. You assign the scores, you do a bell curve distribution with all of your embryos, and then you select accordingly. Um, and we can talk about how people are likely to select. Okay, so here's the problem for prediction markets, or one problem that I think prediction markets can help solve. So when we think about polygenic selection and the fact that there are thousands of heritable diseases, most diseases other than just purely communicable ones, have a small genetic component, and even communicable ones do in a way, right? It's not like the gene is giving you the flu, but genes are gonna influence how you respond to influenza or of various kinds, right? Novel varieties of influenza, et cetera. So almost every disease that you can think of either has a genetic component or the consequences of getting that disease is influenced by genes, right? That means there are thousands. So let's say that we get polygenic scores on hundreds or thousands of diseases. How are we going to prioritize? 
which one we choose. Well, one obvious thing is we can do something like um, a polygenic health index. And the idea here is, I take it what people are going to do in the coming years is they'll look at what their family is uniquely susceptible to. Let's say schizophrenia runs in your family. Or let's say some particular disorder relating to your immune system. Your immune system doesn't re react well to certain viruses. You're going to really pay attention to those two or three traits, let's say. And then among the thousands of other ones that we could predict, we want to do something like a polygenic health index. So you take the probabilities that you're going to get this disease, um, and you think about the quality-adjusted life years or disability-adjusted life years, or whatever other metric you want to use where you say, if you get this disease, this is like the, the total welfare effects for this amount of time on this particular person, which this embryo might become. And then you do that across particular embryos, and you get a quality-adjusted life year score. And then you rank the embryos by that score, and you say, okay, given what I care about, let's say IQ, let's say it's height, let's say it's something else, I'm going to take this into account too, and you have a way of economizing information. So you pay attention to like three or four metrics. IQ, schizophrenia, and then let's say the, um, the polygenic health index. Pretty simple way to choose. It's a way of, again, economizing information. Less obvious one, as I already foreshadowed, prediction markets. So you could either ask parents, what do you think is going to be cured in the next 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? Or ask experts. Or instead of trying to find the experts, you know, you do something like Austin has done and you just create a prediction market that's likely to only attract experts because the people who are non-experts are going to lose a lot of money entering the prediction market. So I think that's a pretty interesting way of doing things because obviously, like it's really hard to predict what's going to be cured and what's not, but there are some people with specialized knowledge with respect to certain kinds of cancer or with respect to certain kinds of psychopathology. You know, is there going to be a drug that helps with Alzheimer's in the next 50 years? I have no idea. There's probably 10 or 20 people, though, who have a pretty good idea about that. OK. Another problem that I think prediction markets might bear on is that a lot of our choices are going to be interdependent. This is kind of the topic that I've written about most over the last five years and, and of my book, which is, um, you know, like a lot of life, our choices are interdependent. You know, this is why game theory is so interesting. This is why the study of economics is interesting. It's really not the study of money. Whenever I tell, like, I don't know, cabbies or something, like, yeah, I study economics, they're like, hey, is there going to be a recession next year? And I'm like, that's not economics. That's like a tiny fraction, right? It's really the study of macro patterns that arise from micro-level choices, rational choices, we call them, right? Those are good or bad patterns. But yeah, I mean, we really care about, um, when we care about our children's welfare, we're going to care about their welfare in a world of other people. And so some traits we're going to select because other people select them, and other traits we select because other people don't. Um, yeah, the obvious case is like height and boys. So if other boys are expected to be, you know, a little bit taller in the next generation, whether you care about height or not, if you know that females find male height attractive, and some of the psychological evidence that Scott could tell us about, I guess, that, you know, taller people are considered more authoritative whether or not that's true. Um, and it goes in both directions, by the way. When um, people see uh, very attractive men, they assume they're taller than they are. Or when they see smarter men, when they see a video of someone who's intelligent and authoritative, they guess their height to be on average taller than they actually are. This is why people find it so shocking that Tom Cruise is only 5'7". How, how could that be possible? It's like an average height. It's like not even that short, right? He's an inch or two shorter than average, but it's just shocking to them because he's got like a symmetrical face and he's a good-looking guy. Same thing for a lot of smart people. Well, we have these preferences for whatever they're shrouded in our evolutionary past, the reasons for them, but once you have them, you know, you have to respond to what other people are likely to do. Um... Okay, and yeah, the traits down here are the ones that you select because other people don't. So, for example, if, you know, their population is expected to be 55% girls, well, you have a stronger incentive to choose a boy. This is why I actually don't think we need regulations on sex selection. I think it's a largely self-equilibrating process, although there's an argument for regulations. Moral dispositions I already mentioned, you know, you can, you can imagine a case in which 
I don't think people will do this, but maybe, you know, everyone's expected to raise the average level of affective empathy on average. And you think, ooh, all right. You know, like I'm going to lower my son's average level of empathy. I don't think most parents will do this, but you could imagine someone doing something like that. Um, and they'll probably be successful in that world. Not if they're so low that they're a dark triad or that they're actually psychopathic. In the modern world, that's not a good strategy for, for doing well in life. But having a little bit less empathy than average, well, from an individual standpoint, is probably a recipe for success. From a social standpoint, it's parasitic. So there may be some you know, dynamic choices like that going on. What's the solution? Well, you can imagine something like this. Um, we gauge parents' preferences and isolation for the traits they want. I think a lot of parents don't really know. They might tell you some things. Maybe you could give them a really extensive survey, give them some information before you give them the survey about the consequences of having those traits. And then you can imagine, again, you know, feeding this into some kind of algorithm and you show the parents if everyone acted on their preferences, their stated preferences, this is what the distribution of traits would look like. Does this change your mind? And you could do this recursively. Actually, it could go on forever. Um, you'd have to like set a stopping point. But um, I mean, this is kind of interesting because again, the aggregate pattern that's expected to result from people acting on their preferences will go back into your loop of what preferences you'll have for your kid. And then we can imagine something similar with a prediction market. So, you know, getting people to make predictions about the distribution of preferences, given the stated preferences people have, and given these kinds of algorithms that are likely to guide them. That could guide parental choice. It could also guide regulators, although I fear regulators here. Um, okay, so that's a little bit of food for thought. I figure we'll focus on that during Q&A and during, really, this is a discussion. This is not meant to be like a passive talk. I just wanted to give you some food for thought here. Before, before we um, get into the discussion, though, I just wanted to sort of give some reasons for why, although there are some problems associated with genetic selection, we can get into various kinds of problems, we probably have some pretty good reasons to allow it and even encourage it, um, and to keep the law, for the most part, out of it. So I want to go through those really quickly. Why should we support it, at least prima facie? Well, nature doesn't select for human happiness. Um, nature selects for traits that tend to leave more copies of themselves. And um, what those traits are depends on the environment and, and lots of other things. Um, but there's no reason to suspect that we're as healthy, happy, and living as optimal lives as we could be right now. We're just a set of evolutionary trade-offs. And that's not to say we should just blindly maximize everything that we care about. There may be some downsides to lots of things. And in fact, probably we wouldn't want children who are just, I don't know, happy in the subjective sense, but not ambitious, not creative, not interesting. Nevertheless, the point here is that it looks like we can increase certain traits that we care about um, without downsides. Mutation load is increasing. So there is an argument from a certain kind of conservative that says, look, you know, yeah, maybe we're not perfect. Maybe we could be better. But let's just kind of stay where we are now because there's downsides to selection. There are risks to it. That's true. And um, yeah, we're, we're in pretty good shape right now, right? The problem is evolution never stops. And when you think about what modern life has done, it's actually accumulated more mutations in the overall gene pool. It has to have. Darwin pointed this out in The Descent of Man. And you can think of some concrete examples for why mutation load has to, almost by definition, increase in modern societies. If you have a certain form of childhood cancer, in many cases, we will treat it now as we should and you will survive that cancer and go on to reproduce yourself. Good for you and good for the kid, that's awesome, right? We've, we've, uh, we've accomplished a really good thing. But now the, you know, the predisposition to get childhood cancer with some probabilities increasing in the population. You have really bad eyesight, how do we fix that? With Well, there's lots of glasses in this room. There are eye surgeries that we can fix it with. Well, you would have been gored by an animal you know, at age 12 or whatever. Purifying selection happened when we had a lot of children. Most of them died of disease or being killed in warfare or animals or whatever. And as gruesome and grisly as that is, that did t tend to keep us evolutionarily honest, so to speak, right? But right now, as Darwin pointed out explicitly, we do our best 
to treat everyone through social welfare programs and through medicine. And that means mutation load, that is deleterious mutations, have to be increasing. It's a consequence of civilization. Finally, or not finally, evolutionary mismatch. We've created societies that are only partly compatible with our, with our brains and our bodies. This is why diabetes is on the rise. Um, this is why, yeah, obesity is on the rise, mental health disorders with dating apps and things like this. The fact that we have a certain technology doesn't mean it's optimal for us. Once enough other people opt into a certain technology, even if we reject the entire thing, like Ted Kaczynski, good luck, you know, opting out of it, right? Your incentives are to opt into Tinder, even if Tinder is on net bad for everyone. Okay, and the reason I mention this is that what we can do is either continually refine our environments to match our genetic endowments, or we can change our genetic endowments to match the kinds of environments that we want to create. Um, this is for the first time a kind of possibility that wasn't there before, right? So those of you who are utopian socialists, I'm not one, but you, know, you can create the socialist man. It just turns out the environment doesn't do that. You'd have to go through a few generations of deliberate selection to do that and solve the evolutionary mismatch problem. Right now, socialism is incompatible with human nature. It doesn't mean it has to be. Right? What did E.O. Wilson say? Like, great idea, wrong species? Not necessarily, right? <laughs> Might be exactly the right species. The only species that could deliberately you know, create that. And then finally, red queen effects. And the idea here that I have in mind from Alice in Wonderland's um, scene in which the Red Queen tells Alice, here you have to run twice as fast just to stay in, in one place. This has been used as a metaphor in sexual selection theory, um, but here I have in mind social selection theory. So imagine Singapore and Israel and India take up genetic selection en masse. Even if you had a moral objection to doing it in a country like ours, um, you're going to get pulled along, almost certainly. And I think that unless you want to diverge in a, in a dramatic way as species, you'd probably want to keep up either at the personal level, at the group level, at the national level with what other groups or nations are doing. So I think whether or not we like it, we will be part of this game. There are going to be these kinds of red queen effects, and they can be either positive or negative. I actually think they're going to be positive. So one way to, to break the blank slate theory, which is, in my view, the heart of wokeism. Wokeism is premised on the idea that all inequalities are the result of discrimination and prejudice and, and this sort of thing. That's premised on the blank slate. I think the quickest way that the blank slate is going to be destroyed is when this is available, this kind of technology, for everyone. And when some countries are using it and people have to pay a price for their false belief that genetics don't actually play a role in, for example, intelligence or moral character or any of these things. OK, um, really quickly, and I'll end in just a second here. Reasons to worry about genetic selection. I, I hinted at some of these, but I wanted to make them more explicit, give an argument against them, and then we'll talk prediction markets um, more informally. So yeah, we might worry about sex ratios becoming imbalanced. I actually think women are going to be selected more than men in developed societies, because you know girls are easier to have than boys. And boys tend to drop out of school. You know, they're, they're more of a risk in the sense that they're, the tails are longer with respect to a lot of traits that we care about. And this is probably an evolutionary strategy by men to take a chance to sire lots and lots of children or to just be entirely sterile. Women tend to cluster more around the mean. So yeah, if women cluster more around the mean, they're a safer bet. So I think people will select for girls more than boys. And this might worry you that we're going to get you know, some sex imbalances. Height, I already talked about arms races for boys. And that has some downstream problems because of like um, health problems. When you're really tall, it can create cardiac problems, you know, difficulties on the knees and ankles and so on. And immunity, we might worry about immunomonocultures, where we're all selecting in, in one direction. But in fact, the whole point of sex, I don't know if you guys have read about this, but W.D. Hamilton first proposed it. And Matt Ridley was the first one that brought it to my attention. But the whole reason sex seems to have evolved is to evade parasites. All giant multicellular creatures reproduce a lot more slowly than parasites do. Um, they have quick life cycles. And what that means is that they're trying out new strategies all the time, right? It's just random strategies 
being invented by the trillions of bacteria and viruses on your body. And eventually, they hit on a strategy that helps them spread themselves quickly. Well, we have an adaptive immune system that partly fights that off, but we also engage in a massive adaptation called recombination, right? We recombine our genes every generation to create really big variability with respect to immunity and other features. You wouldn't want to quash that. You wouldn't want immunomonocultures. So that could be a problem. My solution, which is an imperfect one, is not to rely on all-knowing legislators that are you know, wise and benevolent and you know, get the answer right every time, but instead to defer to something that we call regulatory parsimony. And the idea is when we have these kinds of widespread harms that might result in a collective action problem of the kind that I identified, we should have a few rules that are simple, easy to follow, and apply to all. That's vague, vague by design though, right? What you don't want is a complex set of rules that really raise the cost and the complexity of genetic selection. Why? Because who is that going to help? That's going to help the rich and the well-connected and people close to politicians, and it's going to hurt everyone else. And so I actually think that even the worst kinds of problems identified here should give us, at best, this general principle of regulatory parsimony. If we have any kind of laws at all, they should be simple, few in number, and widely applicable. Why complex laws are easy, as I said, are easier for powerful people to navigate. Too many laws can crowd out social norms, which are more adaptive to local collective action problems. That's why social norms exist. They exist to solve collective action problems. They're emergent orders. And finally, I think restrictive laws, really restrictive laws, can actually do the opposite of what they're supposed to do. They encourage learned helplessness. So in this industry in particular with genetic selection, genetic counseling, which I think is probably a good idea, um, is being more and more adopted. But what a lot of counselors want to do is be super paternalistic toward patients. They're too stupid to understand the complexity, so I'm just going to tell them what they should do or how they should select. I think that the more you do that, the worse people get at navigating probabilities and information. And so I think there should be a general resistance toward doing that, even if people are allowed to opt into it. Okay, so that is it. And yeah, I just wanted to talk with you guys informally now about the role of prediction markets. Thank you. Uh, yeah, should I field the questions or? Malcolm, or Austin, yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, I just had two points of clarification I wanted to ask questions on about IVG. Um, so you were talking about how sort of age and IVG work. Is it that uh, IVG cannot solve age problems, like if a 50-year-old did IVG that would be really old, it would be the same as a 50-year-old egg, or that it adds to age problems? Like if I take, uh, if I create an egg from an IVG sin cell of a 20-year-old woman, that egg is going to be older-like in terms of mutation load than an egg cell that she herself had created. Question one in regards to this. Question two in regards to this is do IVG created eggs and sperm have telomere problems? Like, do they get that re-added to them in some way? Or do they have like the telomeres of an older person? I don't know the answer to the second question, but the first question is, yeah, it would be better for a 20 year old to do this than uh, a 40 year old. No, no, but would it be yeah. the same as if it was her own egg or is it actually old? No, because eggs, so eggs and sperm, probably for evolutionary reasons, have countermeasures to developing de novo mutations. So you can imagine, for example, with skin cells, although they also have countermeasures, right? Or otherwise you get skin, cancer all the time. But skin cells are like, you know, they're, they're exposed to all these carcinogens all the time and mutagens. I should say mutagens, that's the problem. Stomach cells as well, because there's all this, these chemicals from your food and all that stuff. So those probably, well, on the one hand, they're gonna have the highest number of de novo mutations, although they also have mechanisms to resist it, but sperm and egg cells have the strongest incentives to have evolved to resist these. And so they're gonna be the lowest level. So skin cells will be, I think, always higher mutation loads than uh, a sperm or egg cell, yeah. This is, uh, this is, you said, an informal discussion, so uh, I'm, yep. going to, I'm going to take advantage of that. Please do. Please do. Question more of a game say. Yeah. Uh, the explanation I've heard for why sex exists is that um, it's really hard to clear out mutational load if you need a, like a specific mutation to undo uh, yeah. the yeah. random thing. Yeah. And this, this would yeah. be a lot better. You, run, you shuffle it up, and then you filter the mode a lot easier. 
I think I think that's right. I think that's got to be part of the explanation. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. Um, it seems like a lot of this genetic selection thing could potentially have a lot of like downstream effects that you wouldn't have uh, until like far into the future. So I was thinking, do you have any thoughts on like trial periods, like weighing out these trial periods, and how long that would take, or thoughts of that? Um, it depends on what you're talking about, like which traits. So can you say more, like what would you, what would you worry about specifically? Like the, would, are you worried about the accuracy of polygenic scores? Are you worried about, so like what aspects are you, are you thinking about? Yeah, like potentially, um, I don't know about the specifics, but then I'm, I'm guessing there might be some biological downstream effects or social, sociocultural downstream effects that you wouldn't really know about until the um, the Good. baby that was genetically selected to be like, I don't know, 18 or at least adult age. So like, yeah. I would say the trial period would be useful, but I don't know. Excellent. I'm glad you differentiated that into two parts, too, because, okay, the downstream cultural effects, I think, are going to be enormous, um, and I think they're going to be enormously beneficial for the, for the most part, although we can debate that, because I think one of, the, one of the worst aspects of modern life in large liberal societies is we've forgotten a lesson that's at least a couple hundred years old, which is equality under the law and moral equality do not presuppose genetic equality, but we've fallen into this trap that to even notice that there are sex differences on average or individual differences, which is what drives evolution, that's supposed to somehow be a right-wing idea now, which is insane. And the reason for that is supposedly if we acknowledge genetic inequalities, then somehow that undermines moral equality because then we're all gonna become, I don't know, racist or discriminatory. I think that's obviously false. And that's the premise of wokeism, is, and the faster we destroy that, the better off we all are. It's the only way that our society is going to survive, frankly. We're tearing ourselves apart right now over really nothing. On the other hand, um, for the other question, so there will be big implications, and maybe you'll have some ideas that you can tell me about, um, about what you think the social implications will be. I think they're going to be good. Um, yeah, in terms of the genetic implications or, or seeing whether or not these scores work and what happens, turns out we don't have to wait for embryos to develop into people to know if polygenic risk scores work. And there's a really simple way of validating these predictors before anyone's ever born. It's already been done, in fact, for some predictors. And here's, here's, here's how it works. Take siblings from a really large family, let's say in Utah or Israel. Yes, I'm stereotyping, you know, so... Mormon families or an Orthodox Jewish family, or it could be any ethnicity, of course. But it's easier to do it in large families where you've got 10, 15 uh, brothers and sisters. And think about genetically their relationship to each other. It turns out it's the same relationship as embryos have to each other in a Petri dish. And if we can polygenic risk score, if we can you know, biopsy an embryo and predict their future, and we can do the same for existing siblings. And it turns out our polygenic risk scores do explain within a couple of inches the height of existing people or whether or not they have breast cancer or whether or not, you know, what their IQ is, whatever, within five or 10 points. Cause you can't really, you can't use genes to like get an exact IQ score. You can't even do it for an exact height and you'll never be able to do it for an exact IQ score. But if it works pretty well and you can rank order existing siblings, by how smart they are, and you're right, say 90% of the time, it's pretty good, right? And the same thing for any other trait that you care about. So it turns out, I mean, it's a great objection or a great worry, um, but it has been solved or can be solved pretty easily. It hasn't been done for all traits, but there are sibling studies, for example, for height using polygenic risk scores, and it works, so yeah. So you made this uh, somewhat ominous point that we've built this society that is a lot, that's much too complicated for the average person to understand. And I think about this every time I'm doing something involving either health insurance or taxes. I, I think yeah. about like, what someone, there are a lot of people in this country who struggle to pass high school. What do they do when they look at this form? How do they handle it? Do they just choose randomly? And so um, it does... It is nice that we could build a better, you know, have, have people who are better able to handle these problems. But now we actually have an even more complicated system because now it's not just the institutions and the rules, but it's also the tweaks and the rules for those tweaks. And so we have this even more complicated system where actually 
the fact that people don't change that much and that we're all pretty limited and a lot of our traits are, are normally distributed, it means that we have really good data on how people behave. Like if people do something confusing, you can, you can go back and, you know, read something from the Old Testament or read Jane Austen and be like, oh, that, that universal trait is what I'm seeing right now. Right. But if those traits become less universal and if we have this big shift in how people behave and it's all on the things that are most legible, the things where you can actually compute a mean and standard deviation, then we've actually added to complexity in a system that we're worried was already too complex. Yeah, good, good point. And actually, to marry these last two points, I actually think... Um, one of the unanticipated results of widespread genetic enhancement, which is not coming in the next five years, but let's say the next 50 years, um, is political changes. I think we're going to rethink the, the moral foundations of political societies. Why do we live together in groups? Um, you know, most people don't think about this stuff. I mean, I do, you know, I did a PhD in this sort of stuff, not in genetics and political philosophy. Um, what the Greeks thought is very different than what we think. What Singapore and their leaders have thought for the last 50 years is very different than what the US thinks, um, either our leaders or the people. And I think that what's going to happen is people are gonna cluster more together, um, potentially in smaller political societies with enough land to be defensible along traits that they care about. And I think there are gonna be some people like, let's say the Amish, who just look a lot like they do now, 200 years from now, and maybe there are a lot more of them in, in one area of land, and then there are gonna be super enhanced people and everything in between, and there's gonna be some really fucking weird traits, like aesthetically, intellectually, and it's just gonna get really complicated. But what are social norms and political societies for? They're for aggregating preferences and personality types in ways that are more efficient than leaving them go alone. That's the Hobbesian view, right? Um, Hobbes is right about that, even if he's wrong about other things. Um, and so, yeah, I see the wild ride being not just the different forms humanity takes over the next, let's say, 200 years, but the different ways in which we cluster together politically. I think that's gonna change dramatically. We've got this weird World War II, post-World War II consensus where it's just like, yeah, everyone's just gonna be like a, a large liberal society that's multicultural, and it's like, yeah, I think the opposite is true. I think we're already seeing that breakdown, and we're going to see a massive breakdown of that in the next 50 years. But that, that's my long answer. Sorry, that's a, that's a lot, but yeah. Uh, okay. Do you envision that certain subcultures that have an interest in preserving themselves might uh, find a way to like, like for example, there's the case of the deaf people wanting to have deaf children or people yeah. with like different sexual preferences, just like forking off humanity basically, yes. even potentially permanently forking off? Yep. Yeah, I think some people will select in favor. I mean, homosexuality is a, is a difficult case because it's clearly not only genetic. Um, and I was mentioning we had a discussion, a uh, friend here and I, last night about how I've had two students who are identical twins, and two of them are, one is gay and the other is not. They grew up in the same womb, they have the same genetic. So clearly the environment matters there, but yeah, it looks like there are some, some genetic predispositions, some hormone balances in the womb or hormone ratios. But yeah, you could at least imagine on the genetic component of homosexuality or of some of these other traits, people selecting for it, not against it. Yes, I think so. I think in religious communities, it'll go one way and in other communities, it'll go the other way. Here we are in Berkeley, it'll probably go you know, that way. And there's um, nothing stopping yeah. them from adjusting their culture to intensify the selection towards what they want in their children. Yeah, here's, here's something that may blow your mind. Maybe you've already thought about it, but Okay, if the religious and the politically conservative are having more children than the opposite right now, which is happening both within and between countries, that's observable reality, which is why Eric Kaufman wrote his book, Shall the Religious Inherit the Earth? Um, if that's already going on now, you can imagine a couple of things, a little bit science fiction-y. The first one is easy to imagine, which is religious people selecting for religiosity. It's not highly heritable like height, right? It's not like you just could come out with a Bible out of your, you know, fly out of the womb with a Bible or something. But there are personality traits that lend themselves to, you know, being more or less religious or having a certain political orientation. So we could imagine that, but we could also imagine people who worried about their offspring, you know, making a genetic mistake as they saw it. Which is, you could, you could imagine, it's not gonna be a caste system like there's the alphas and the betas. This is why these movies are so fucking stupid, you know, like Gattaca or whatever. Um, no, there's gonna be a thousand castes. There's gonna be a million castes, right? It's not two. 
But now imagine like, imagine that you're in a genetic cast, so to speak, and you want to make sure that your kid doesn't make the wrong choices, whether it's on IQ or religiosity or political orientation or whatever it is, and you insert some genetic endowment, some set of genes that basically makes it impossible to breed with other humans, let's call them. Um, and I'm not even picturing something radically different than what we are now. I mean, the concept of species is a weird one, right? Because there are all these different definitions that conflict with each other. But one is something like, you know, the ability to, to interbreed within a particular group. Well, we could create, we could get speciation, not even by changing our form very, very much, but by manipulating genes that allow us to breed with other people within a particular group. So I see all kinds of crazy things like this happening, but I'd be interested in hearing what you guys think. I mean, I could imagine this happening. So, yeah. Cool. Um, well, there's a lot more to say on this, but we're unfortunately at time. Um, ah, so okay. let's do uh, one more round of applause for uh, Thanks, guys. Thank you.